What is breatharianism? Breatharianism is basically going without、uh, a food source or a liquid source. It's about not needing something outside of you and realizing that you contain everything you need and that all forms of energy is just simply energy. And you are energy, so therefore you don't lack energy since that's what you are. So, breatharianism is just the ability to go in a sense without food and liquid, but you don't actually lack anything by going without it. And that's why you actually accomplish breatharianism, is because you realize you don't lack anything. When we feel like we are not able to produce enough love for our own selves, and we are not getting enough love from those around us either, so we also go to a source of love outside of ourselves. And really, food is this for us also. This is another reason that our society is so addicted to food. This is not just about a physical nourishment where we have forgotten that our mind is controlling our body. And so we feel like we can't give everything to our body that it needs and we have to go to an outside source for that physical nourishment. One thing I noticed in my own life that She was talking about was, yeah, when, you, when we give into these cravings of eating food out of emotions, one of the big emotions that we eat it out of is feeling unworthy. And we try to feel worthy by eating foods that are tastier. Just like we try to feel worthy by being around certain people that seem cooler. You know, whatever we have to do to make ourselves feel more worthy, we'll do it. But that's ultimately what somebody would need to accomplish. To become breatharian, they would have to realize their worth. They would have to realize that they contain everything that they need, that they don't lack anything. And once they really realize that mentally completely and they remove all these negative beliefs, then they won't have these negative needs where they have to pull something in because that's what negativity is. Negativity, it represents less, it represents a decrease in something. And so, if we're experiencing a lot of negativity, then that means we constantly feel like we're going without. And what, do we, what does everyone say? Everyone says to go within. And so, that is where the answer really lies to everything, and including these negative needs, such as having to eat. The reason we eat is that, it, that, is, that is another sign that we're going outside of ourselves and not going within enough. So, we need to learn to. Go within, and the more we go within, the more we won't need to go outside of ourselves. That's why everyone in the new age now is all speaking about going within. And when you really master that, I believe and we believe, when you really master that, you will not need outside sources as much, you know, the more you master that. And that includes physical sources. And that does take a bit more mastery, obviously. It's different not needing you know, emotional comfort. That's not as hard to, to overcome. Not needing physical you know, nourishment is a bit harder. That's you know, more advanced because your mind would have to advance much more than you know, if you were to just stop giving into wanting to be emotionally comforted by someone. And this really brings us to. The process of becoming breatharian and going without food and going without liquids. Because, like Wolf was saying, we have all these things that we feel that we lack. And all of these feelings, these are beliefs that we have. We have all these different beliefs or thought forms within us and around us that are telling us. Why we lack something when we don't. And so, a lot of times people equate breatharianism with just dropping all food sources, dropping all liquid sources, and just going breatharian, or even making some huge transition like just going to liquidarianism and 
staying on it for a very long time or attempting to stay on it permanently without making any kind of transitions. A remote Scottish loch is thought by police to have starved herself to death. The astonishing thing about this tragedy, though, is that she seems to have starved herself deliberately. She belonged to a cult, or so-called cult, which practices breathanarianism, the belief that you don't need food or water necessarily, but can live literally on air. This is the kitchen of a breatharian. For 63 days, this woman has, she claims, gone without any food whatsoever, apart from fish stock tea with a dash of cider vinegar. She believes it would help her to live longer, more healthily, and with greater mental alertness. I am nourished by prana, as, as uh, old uh, Eastern religion did believe that there is a prana in the air or chi energy or something like that. I know that I am uh, nourished, and I am nourished probably very, very well, much better than I was nourishing myself. Some scientists have lent a certain amount of credence to the notion that eating very little can be good for you. Starving lab mice and monkeys to the equivalent of a human 800 calories a day has been shown in certain cases to extend life and increase alertness. But that is a very far cry from eating nothing at all. The human body is totally dependent on food for everything it does. In the same way that a car needs petrol, a body needs food and nobody can do without that. Anyone who tells you that they can survive for long periods of time with no food is either kidding themselves, i.e. they are actually eating small quantities of food, enough to keep them going, or they're not telling the truth, they're telling you lies. Self-deprivation and even self-mutilation has played a part in just about every religion. The pilgrimages of Indian sadhus are often characterized by making the journeys in a variety of painful, impractical ways, like rolling across India. And in the quest for spiritual purity, deliberate self-mutilation has always been highly valued in some communities. In Iran, Islamic demonstrations of loyalty to Khomeini were often made through self-flagellation. Closer to home, Catholic monks have for centuries taken vows of abstinence and silence. And most famously, firewalkers have for centuries been showing that what you think may be incredibly bad for you can in fact have a strong spiritual value. It's actually the whole notion of pleasure and actually enjoying the physical body which is considered bad. It's not just the intake of food, it's sexuality as well and any other sort of material pleasure. Because what they're really trying to do is to get themselves to a stage when they can really be at a higher spiritual level and not have to depend on physical environment. Well, we're joined now from Brisbane by Jasmine Heen, who is uh, the uh, author of uh, Living on Light. And, and uh, how long did you go without eating? I've been experimenting with this for about six years, but I prepared for this journey for well over 20 years. I'd been a, me a meditator for a long period of time, a number of decades. I've been practicing vegetarianism, vegan, raw food, things like that as well. So it's a long journey. It's not an overnight journey. And we like to stress that if people at home do this without this level of preparation, they could experience a lot of problems. Specifically, how long did you go without eating? For me, on and off, uh, well, pretty well just on water and tea for two years. Uh, and did you lose weight? No, because I treat the body as a biocomputer, the mind as a software program, and you can reprogram the body if you have a strong mind-body connection so that the body's weight will stabilize. Now, this assumes that you are being nourished. The woman you just had speaking about this said that we do need food, and that's 100% correct. A body does need food to survive. Um, but that food can come in the form of prana or ki energy. And what I'd I beg like your to pardon? share with your view... I beg your pardon? What, what I'd like to share with... Go on. Your... Uh, what I'd like to share with your readers, your viewers, is that there's so much scientific experimentation being done on this already, like scientific Kijun exploration, which has been put together by one of the heads of the Chinese scientific community, uh, uh, Professor Lu Zinyun, and he talks about the state of bijou that people go into where they're living normal lives and they're not eating. Okay, where, where, very rare. 
sure. mainly drinking as well. Where are they getting their sustenance from if they're not getting it from food? Ki, the chi, the universal life force, or what we call prana, or if you're a religious person, you would say you are fed by the light of God, and yeah. obviously that's very hard to measure. This is nonsense. But with ki, it's not hard to measure. Th this is just... It's not th nonsense this is just when you do If you research. don't eat, you die. But that's most people's belief systems in the Western world, and that's why these studies are so powerful and important now. See, every second second, a child dies of hunger-related diseases. Yes, look. And I've found in my research that you can apply the lifestyles that we are living as ambassadors of life to take care of a lot of world health and world hunger-related problems. I, I don't mean to belittle your, your beliefs, and I'm sure they're sincerely held, but there is a woman who is dead in Scotland as a consequence of mm -hmm. following your well, principles. We, Yes, we don't really know what happened in that situation. Well, we know that the diary she, she left behind. We need to leave. Well, we don't need to leave it because we know that the diary that she left behind, that was found with her body, makes extensive references to your book and your ideas. She starved mm. herself to and death. You, well, also too, who controls the time of birth and who controls the time of death? There are people with very strong connections with the divine who feel that that is a contract between you and the divine. I think it's very important that people are well prepared because I hate the fact that there are people who could possibly do damage to themselves from following these type of practices. But we'd like to stress that we are not a cult. This is simply um, a sharing of information that will allow people to take greater control over their health, their happiness, their vitality, if it is practiced um, and well prepared for properly. How many other people have died as a consequence of following this belief system? There was a woman in Australia who went into a coma and was taken off life support systems later when she was um, going through the 21-day process with a man called Jim Pesnack and he's awaiting trial at this point. The concern is not that she couldn't live on light from what the police have been investigating because they've found enough information now through other fields of research with okay. the yogis to say this is possible. Their concern was was he negligent in calling the right. police before okay. the um, ambulance beforehand. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. And the thing about that is your body has to have time to adjust to your new mental output and belief system. But also the thing is, so does your subconscious mind. And so just cutting out all food, cutting out all liquids could be a complete disaster. Someone could end up very sick or end up in the hospital because their subconscious mind is still believing that that is what will happen to them if they refrain from taking in outside sources to fill them. So it's all about realizing that, like we said, that you are everything, that you are connected to everything and you are connected to everyone. Part of the reason that we feel that we lack something is because of this illusion of separation that we experience where we believe I am my body and I am cut off from everyone else and their body and everything else around me. We don't see the connection of energy from us to everything else around us. But right now in the, in the New Age, everyone knows that we're all one. They know this consciously. But if you really know that consciously, then that means you're one with the chicken. Your energy is one with the chicken's energy. You're connected. So does it really make sense that you would need to take the chicken's energy into yourself if it's the same energy as yours in a sense? If you're connected to it? If you're already connected to it, why would you need to pull it in? The only reason we create this illusion of having to pull it in is because we believe in an illusion. And the illusion is separation. So it's all about realizing that we do not lack anything, but also anyone, because that's what eating has to do with. It has to do with taking another's existence. But we only do that because we believe that our existence is going to run out if we don't take another's in. Animals on earth are reflections of us. And that's why in nature you can clearly see, you know, it's all about the fear of loss of existence. It's all about survival. And what is survival? Question that. Survival is just about staying in existence and doing whatever you can to stay in existence and if that means taking another's existence to stay in existence that's what you got to do right as an example when you see a lion and a gazelle out in africa in nature and you see 
the lion is, you know, stalking the gazelle. You don't necessarily feel like the lion is, you know, fearful of the gazelle or fearful for its own life in a sense. In a sense, it is because you, you know it has to eat, right? But that's what I'm trying to say here is that the lion is going after the gazelle because the lion feels like if he doesn't, he's going to lose. He's, his life is going to be lost if he doesn't take another's. So the only thing that's actually creating that illusion that we are experiencing is our beliefs. Because like he said, you are energy. So it absolutely makes no sense that you would need energy from outside of you. Really, you don't. And when you think about it, that is obvious, really. But it is our beliefs that have manifested physically and create these experiences. So breatharianism means going within and having a self-realization, realizing who you are and that you are all you need. Hey, um, my name is Ray Moore. I'm a breatharian or practicing breatharian for the last two years of my life. And in this short video, I would just like to explain how I became or how I came to be. So, I was always a conscious explorer. I always wanted to have more out of life. But just like a normal uh, guy, you can say, I had my ego, I had my doubts, I had my, uh, my life, you can say. And one day, after I think about nine, uh, nine months traveling around the world, I came back home to Israel and I joined a group of people that are trying to do good in the world. We were called the Revolution of Love. And I met this amazing guy. Amazing guy, really. Uh, I saw he had a lot of energy. I saw this spiritual enlightenment in his eyes when we talked. And after some time, he confided in me and told me, uh, Ray, about two years ago, or uh, one and a half years ago, I was in Brazil and I had this uh, pranic initiation process that allowed my body and my consciousness to have a leap and now I don't really need food anymore I just mostly drink and if I do I don't drink much I enjoy life in different ways I wanted to experience that and so I was like what? and I asked a lot of questions obviously in Israel we are very skeptical uh, due to our political problems you can say or the, the, uh, the Jewish way of looking at things and I started investigating, you know, there's not a lot of information about it in the world. So I saw about Prajani, which is the Indian guy that hasn't eaten or drink in the last 70 years. He had a scientific uh, study done about it for 10 days in the hospital. And I saw a lot of YouTubes about it and there's not a lot of information. There's not a lot of people that are normal, you can say, uh, that can explain about this. And this is why I decided to take it to the next level. So my guide, which was that guy, uh, explained to me what he could in his own way. And I'm a very mental, scientific, spiritual person, so I needed a lot more information. I decided to investigate by myself whatever I could. And after about three months, I told him, look, I want to do this. I really want to do this. So we set a date. And until that day, I saw many things that been beginning to change in the way I see things. Suddenly I became less hungry, more energetic. Suddenly I was more attracted to meditating or to people with a higher frequency. I understood that my life is changing towards a moment. Uh, when I just met him and I heard about it, it was like my future self was calling me from the future saying, Ray, this is you, you need to experience this. This is like a soul uh, uh, cry out saying, whoa, there's something interesting here, experience this and it will take you to the next level. So we set a date, for me it was uh, January 15, I think, uh, 2013, about two years ago, exactly actually two years ago. So I did the initiation process, at that time it was the 21 day initiation process, which is considered to be harder. It means seven days without food or water, isolated, uh, two more weeks without uh, food obviously because after that you don't really eat 
uh, with really, really, really little juice, you can say, mostly for the taste. But the seven first days are the amazing part that the change really happens in. The body needs, actually, we understood this from the 10 day process and uh, from different uh, channeling sessions uh, that we took the advice of others in higher beings that it requires three and a half to four days of, uh, of a dry fast. And in that dry fast, most people are concerned, but there's really not much to be concerned about. It's just something that you haven't experienced yet. But as we do, when we do it in a group, it's not a problem. So we d I did that. When I did it, it was an amazing feeling. And I opened up to art. I became more feminine, more in touch with my feminine patience, green, uh, nature-loving side. My ego was reduced. I suddenly was aware that I can look at myself from the side uh, as an observer. as an observer and was capable of making higher conscious decisions for my life. So that's why I decided to make it my life quest to alert people about this, to explain to them, to show them that this can be achieved. Even if someone makes the initiation, it's a one-sided way. After he makes it, and if he decides to completely return to a normal food lifestyle, then he can always become a breatharian again. He can do it because he becomes a master. There's a lot about in, like uh, listening to your inner guides. There's a lot about listening to your intuition and understanding. Because once you go through the initiation, which is one of the, I don't know, highest or most uh, effective courses that our planet has to offer the Western world right now, you realize a lot. You realize things that you didn't think that you would realize. You thought you had this and this difficulty, you thought you would have physical difficulty, but apparently most people have difficulties with uh, society. Society not being able to accept this uh, as a viable option. And in the 10 day process uh, that I now transfer or pass around the world, I teach exactly that. How do we deal with it? How do we deal with the emotional burden of letting go of a lot of things? and how this influences when the old us and the new us after the initiation process meet. So, after I decided to do that, I wrote a website. It was in Hebrew. I started giving small lectures here and there. Officially, I'm, I'm in high tech. I, uh, I run a, a computer programmers team and we make applications. So, I'm a very scientific person. I decided to make the website and explain my short story. Obviously, there was a lot of criticism, a lot of misbeliefs, uh, which I was uh, able to endure uh, quite easy because it is my own process and I'm very strong. After a while, a television show decided to contact me and to make an experience. So I was like, cool, yeah, that's exactly what I wanted. It was my intention to do this eventually. And another guy had a really big wager with me, about $100,000, if this is true. So I decided to take that wager with the television show, in a scientific aspect, completely under video surveillance, and do eight days without food or water. And that was an amazing experience. I don't have a television. I don't really uh, like the brainwashing that comes with it, you know. So I decided to do it and I learned a lot about the television world, what they cut, what they show. In the first four days, everybody was really, really skeptical, trying to make a drama and trying to make me and the doctor maybe argue. I'm not the type of person one can, one can argue with because I just never argue. I don't get emotional. I understand that my emotions are my own responsibility and this is also what I try to teach, taking complete responsibility of our emotions. On our level, and on our higher spirit level that has decided to put us in different situations in life so we can endure and learn from them. Now here is Mr. Wiley Brooks who stopped eating 17 years ago claiming that all the elements we need to survive are in the air and an occasional glass of fruit juice. Uh, this is called breatharianism and if it sounds hard to swallow we're going to find out now from the man who knows. Would you please welcome Mr. Wiley Brooks. Here he is. Wiley, welcome to our show. Thank you. Let me ask you something. 
You, you, you haven't eaten for 17 years. You have not had a sandwich, a hamburger, hot dog, pretzel, a piece of roast beef, fish, vegetables, nothing for 17 years. Right. Well, let me explain what breatharianism is first, okay. if I might. Breatharianism But you is, haven't eaten for 17 yes, years right, as we know it. Okay. Right. I don't eat... Yes. Breatharianism is a philosophy that believes that the human body, when it's in perfect harmony with itself and nature, is a perfect breatharian. Now, all of the constituents that we need is taken from the air we breathe. And the fact is, there is only one thing that keeps the human body alive, and that is breathing. The food that we take is the same as any other thing we take into the body as it becomes a habit. In other words, eating is an acquired habit just like drinking alcohol or smoking cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Well, does that mean that when a baby is born, you don't have to give it anything to eat, no milk or anything? No, that would only work if the mother was a breatharian. Because we don't come into the world as breatharians from mothers that are breatharian, before we even get started, our blood is poison. You see, we already start at a disadvantage when we're born. So because of that, a person needs to be an adult, and that's why I don't even lecture people who are young about being a breatharian. First, you must kick the habit of eating. You see, we've done... <laughs> yes, that's right. How did you kick it? Yes. Well, in my case, I had a real good reason for wanting to do it, and that's the reason, that is the thing that will help anyone. Go to a bad to restaurant every night, that'd right. do it, wouldn't you? That helps, too, yeah. right. But my main reason was that I was getting old, you know, and I was, uh, my hair was falling out, and my father bawled very early, and of course the answer was that it's hereditary. And I hear that all the time. Every time a person stumps his toe, it's hereditary. You see, but I didn't accept that. So I did not want to get old. I was at 28 at the time, and I'm almost 50 now. Uh, well, 40, 46. So, and uh, I decided... Let me tell you how you're killing me, you say, and would you believe, Tom, yeah. I'm 97 years well, old. I said, holy <laughs> cow, look at this guy. This is unbelievable, you know? <laughs> well, I like to say that sometimes, but, but, um, but the feeling is, and, and what I found to be an important thing to inspire people to look into this, is the fact that all of the things we've heard about, we must get old and we must get weak. And I think I heard when I was a younger person that a man is twice a child and once a man. And that is not the case. When a person gets older and wiser, he should get younger. He should not die in an unhealthy body. And this is very important. The issue here is not whether I want to die early or will I, whether I will live a long time or not. And that comes up all the time. But the quality of life that I live is the most important thing. And there is no way of having perfect health or perfect happiness without having perfect health. So, Do you breathe, do a lot of deep breathing and things to get the whatever is in the air that's yeah. good for you into your system? No, I don't have to do that. And one of the reasons why I was insistent on finding out how the body worked is because I had always heard that the human body was created by the Creator in perfection. And obviously, if something is created perfect, there's nothing you can do to it but make it less perfect. And that's exactly what man has done. The body was created perfect. It needed nothing but the breath of life which comes from our, the creative source, God or universal intelligence or whatever name you want to put on it. In that state, man was perfect, and all that we have done to it is that we have taken it from that perfect state to a lo lower point of consciousness. And that is why our environments and everything that is in our lives are where they are because of the quality of our blood. You live in Boulder, Colorado. Yes, that's true. They have nice air there, you know what I mean? Yes, that's right. What if you live, forgive me, now this is a great city I'm gonna mention. Yes, I but What if you live in Secaucus, New Jersey? You know, I mean. It would be a problem. Oh, what? Yeah. I think it would. Now, I, now, maybe I'm not right. About, I shouldn't say that so directly because I'm not too sure about a Secaucus. But I know there are a lot of industrial plants in, yes, in Jersey, right? Yes, sir. And that would be a problem. And that is one of the major problems. But clearing up the problem does not happen by trying to do it from the outside. It must be done from the inside. Man's in, uh, environment is the direct representation or the reflection of what man is himself. So actually to clear up our environment is necessary to clear up the blood of the people. You see, once a breatharian is probably more concerned with the air than a person who's eating it. How many breatharians are there in this country, would you say? I don't know of that many. I know of uh, uh, several people that have, uh, that, for instance, there was a young lady who stopped eating when she was nine years old and she didn't eat anything for 10 years. And there are other people that are at varying degrees of breatharianism, you see. So there's another thing that's 
I've got to ask you this one yes. on the air, and okay. you're asked it all the time. Right. We read that the hunger strikers in Belfast died. Right. You're living. That's What's the right. difference? What's the difference? The difference is, very importantly, they wanted to die. And I often, I get this in my lectures all the time, and people do not realize there is a big difference in a man stopping to eat who's trying to kill himself and a person who's not eating because he's trying to improve his health. You see? Mm -hmm. That is the difference. Health is the thing here. Breatharianism just happens to be a word that seems to be new, but it's been around as long as man has been here. But man has a choice of eating or not eating. I am a not against eating, and I, one of the things I'd like to point out right away is I don't recommend fasting. Now, I know everybody thinks they should run out and stop eating, and I don't recommend that, because that is not the way to do it. The body has to adjust gradually and retrace itself back to the original state mm -hmm. of health, which was breatharianism. That's the way I view it. I figure in 25 or 30 years, I'll, you know, make the adjustment to right. where I... <laughs> Do you ever... I guess you don't yeah. get hungry anymore. No, You walk on the streets and smell things That's being right. cooked. You, you doesn't, don't get... mean, doesn't mean a thing, and I can tell you why. It's very simple. If we have an automobile, we have a gauge on it that says empty and full. Mm -hmm. If the automobile is full of gas, is there any need to put any more in it? No. So the meter says full. Same thing with me. Your meter's full. The appetite says one thing. That's right. The appetite says one thing. Your body is lacking energy to keep it balanced properly. Now, when you have satisfied that balance in your system by what other method you, you, you might use, the body has no appetite. So there's no reason to eat. I don't have a lot of time here, but what happens when somebody invites you out to dinner? <laughs> I mean, well, I know. eating is. is a social thing, it, it too. Is. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, Tom, I'd like to point out here that is the most difficult thing about becoming a breatharian. <laughs> <laughs> I, it is, because not only is it, I mean, it's hard for, for, it, for a person to go out and do that, I mean, from my side, but even when I learned to cope with that, I found that I still had difficulty because everybody who knew me would feel guilty about eating all the time. And so. they shouldn't because exactly. you're fine. Exactly. All right. Thank you for being with us tonight, Wiley. My pleasure. Keep going. Happy holidays to you. Thank you. We will continue right after these announcements. My interest has been for many years uh, longevity, why people die. That was basically the, the quest I was born with. And I was also born with another strange thing compared to normal people. I didn't like to eat. I absolutely didn't like to eat. I didn't understand why people ate. I don't know where it came from, but it was the way it was. As you become more healthy, more energy flows through the system, then you become more sensitive. So at my stage of the game, I've been doing this for years, I got to the point where my energy was so high, one, I can't live with anybody, as you can see, my nearest neighbor is several miles away. Now, I'm not here because I like to be alone. It's just that I can't live with anybody. I'm 67 years old, and I've been gazing in the sun for a long time. I own recording studios, and I recorded people like Led Zeppelin, Iron Butterfly, and Jimi Hendrix were some of my clients. Around the time I was working with Jimi Hendrix in New York is really the time I got really inspired because when he passed away, as many of my clients did, I just became obsessed with the idea of finding out why we die. And so as I looked around, I noticed most of the people that actually had any knowledge about this type of thing always fasted. So I decided to try fasting to see what would happen. And sure enough, the first fast I did, which was about 10 days, I ended up having 10 times more energy. I happened to be living at the time on Muscle Beach in California where the bodybuilders work out. And I decided one day to go out and see if I could lift any weight. So I went out to the weightlifting pen. I started putting on the weights. And the first time I was out, I noticed as I put the plates on, the weights got lighter. So the very first time I walked into the weightlifting pen, I ended up with 800 pounds on the bar. At the time, we had Arnold Schwarzenegger, Mr. T, a lot of the other, you know, professional bodybuilders, and to them, I was sort of like a joke because I'm a little skinny guy lifting all that weight. But when I started lifting 1,100 pounds of weight, I started to get a little attention. 
before I fasted, I couldn't lift probably 50 pounds. I never even tried to. So then I had a whole new uh, direction to look in because now I needed to find out why it is I lift, I eat less, and suddenly, without any other disciplines, I'm 10 times stronger. If we eat because we don't have enough energy. But what happens when you're in the sun, which is a natural energy for all living things, right? When you have enough sun, then the energy in the body rises to the point where you don't have an appetite. So there's no need to eat. That doesn't mean I have not been eating for 30 years. My purpose for eating is to lower my frequencies, not to increase it. It's almost like for me, it's necessary to not be too healthy because otherwise I wouldn't be able to go out and be anywhere. I might want to pull it a little lower, maybe. We want to use the smaller 45. Well, we're going to put a whole bunch on there. Yeah, yeah. 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 Put that weight. But you want to put, well, I don't know about a thousand. Okay. No, no. Are you kidding well, we'll work. me? We'll, we'll see what we Let's can. see what we can do. If I can lift the bar, I'm, I'll be happy. And I did lift the bar. <laughs> How many hours do you sleep a week, Wiley? Well, I sleep, I, I normally sleep one to seven hours a week. And I mean, some nights I sleep one hour, some nights I sleep a little more. What do you do with all that time? Well, that's the thing. Just, um, I hate to admit it, but I get a little bored once in a while. No, you're not supposed to if you're spiritual enhanced. <laughs> Fasting is basically a belief system. I mean, whether one eats or not is a belief system without a doubt. I discovered that is the belief system that controls our lives. For example, ask anybody, what do you think would happen if you don't have any food? Right off the bat, they say, I will die. But I never warm up, I never exercise, so I should just warm up a tiny bit. I lifted 500 pounds of weight to demonstrate that the lifting of the weight basically has to do with the amount of energy that flows through the system. At my age, even, I can still lift, uh, you know, uh, at least five or 600 pounds. So that was the demonstration. And I also learned that I probably should exercise a little more. <laughs> Aside from the controversies in the Vanna case, there was another study conducted in India in 2003 that bafflingly seems to confirm the phenomenon of pranic feeding. It was conducted on a yogi who claims he has neither eaten nor drunk for decades. But what is behind these incredible accounts on the internet? Of course, I'm eager to meet this mysterious yogi, and I get the rare opportunity to film him in his native village. Mataji Praladiani normally lives in a cave in the mountains, but once a year he visits his family to celebrate the holy Navratri festival. Here the yogi is worshipped as a holy man who had a vision at the age of seven and allegedly hasn't had a bite of food or drop of water since. Also 60 Jahre ohne Wasser und, und, und ohne Essen und ohne Energie, 
Das glaube ich schlicht und einfach nicht. Das ist denkunmöglich. Ich habe es mir abgewöhnt zu sagen, das gibt es nicht, sondern ich sage eigentlich nur mehr, ich kann mir das nicht vorstellen. Es gibt in Indien ja, eine richtige Tradition diesbezüglich von Menschen, die ohne Nahrung leben. Das, was auffallend ist und was sich wie ein roter Faden durch alle diese Geschichten zieht, das sind Behauptungen von Einzelpersonen. Und es gibt keinen einzigen objektiven Nachweis. Natürlich, wenn in so vielen Traditionen solche Berichte existieren, warum sollten die alle gelogen sein? Das ist ja völlig unrealistisch. Ja, ja, gut, dann wäre es ja interessant, dass man dann sozusagen, weil sie vier, fünf, sechs Leute zusammenfindet, die eben vertrauenswürdig sind und die könnten ihn dann beobachten. Nicht? Dr. Sudhir Shah, I am Director of Neurosciences at Sterling Hospital, a city-based corporate hospital of a very high stature. Oh, one doctor telephoned me that he is aware of a person, that is Prahla Jani, who is not eating, not drinking anything for nearly 64 years. Uh, I mean, I was very skeptic to what all he said, and uh, I laughed it out. I said, uh, I think it's unbelievable. I, doctor, I mean, what are you talking? Have you, uh, have you got any evidence for that? You know, doctor, I'm just telling that uh, these people have brought him to me, and I know this Madhari for some time, and if you would like to study, I can ask him to see you. One day, he came to my office and uh, said that, yeah, okay, I'll allow you to investigate, but nothing invasive should be done in my body. I said, uh, you will have to be in the hospital under continuous uh, video monitoring. And uh, if you are true, I will put your good remarks to the world. If you are wrong, I will have to literally undress you. In the sense, uh, this is cheating. If you are prepared, then come. So Dr. Sudhisha approached me regarding this Mataji. And for the medical science, this is uh, not possible. I was so hopeless to begin with that I thought that it would not continue for more than 24 hours. The project of Trilla Jani or Mataji to prove that he is not taking anything. He is not taking food, not taking uh, water, nor passing urine and not passing stool. This had to be proved only physically. You have to keep a watch on him and it could be proved. So it was constantly observation under uh, my supervision. All the security personnel were, was uh, from the hospital side and it was a camera observation. I started my mind that he is, uh, he is cheating and this is not going to continue. So from day one only, I took all possible measures to see that he is not left alone for a moment. We went on changing the security. We went on changing the cameramen so that they cannot make any problem. We went on putting two cassettes simultaneously so that even while changing the cassettes, he may not pass urine. At the end of the project, our conclusion was Mr. Prahlad Jani did not take anything orally, neither fluid, nor water, nor food during these 10 days of our project. Number two, Mr. Prahlad Jani did not pass urine or stool during these 10 days, although we could see formation of urine in his bladder, which was reabsorbed from the bladder. I was doing his sonography twice a day for seven days, morning, evening, morning, evening. And there was ups and downs. One time it is a 400 ml, then 200 ml, 300 ml urine. But at the end of the study, gradually, there was no urine in his urinary bladder. He was claiming that he is absorbing the urine in his body, which was difficult to explain as far as the science is concerned. We did have a protocol which included complete blood count, ESR, 
renal function test, endocrinal test, liver function test, and all x-rays, including whole body CT scan. The surprising part was all his organs were normal, morphologically. His chest was clear, kidneys, liver, spleen, everything was normal. Everything was normal and there was no even changes because of the age. I mean, all possible things that could be done non-invasively in this hi-fi corporate hospital with the help of so much involved consultants who are all, most of us are trained abroad also. And we were just scratching our head as to, as to this, the greatest surprise that we saw in our lifetime so far. Es ist für mich faszinierend und voll, wirklich vollkommen unverständlich. Es ist jenseits meiner Vorstellungskraft und ich habe das jetzt gerade das erste Mal gesehen und äh, es hat ja, also wenn Sie mir das so erzählt hätten, hätte ich gesagt, ich glaube es nicht. Er hat über zehn Tage weder uriniert noch hat er Stuhl unter sich gelassen, noch hat er irgendetwas getrunken, noch irgendetwas gegessen und es gibt die Laborbefunde von ihm. Man würde sich erwarten, dass die handpflichtigen Substanzen haushoch sind. Das ist eine absolute Bombe.